Who was King Tut? By Roberta Edwards. Who was King Tut? In June of 2005, Pharaoh fever struck California. In just one month, half a million people streamed into the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. They wanted to see the dazzling jewelry and household items that once belonged to a king of Egypt. Everyone was very excited to see beautiful furniture and lamps, musical instruments, and board games. So many people came, the museum had to stay open until 11 o'clock at night. There was a small chair the king used as a child. There was a chariot that he used to ride. There was a couch in the shape of two spotted cows. Objects that had once belonged to other pharaohs were also on display. There were about 125 objects, including fans and vases and folding chairs and clothes. Although many things looked brand new, they weren't. They were more than 3,000 years old. For all that time, everything lay hidden under the sands of Egypt in a secret tomb. Early in the 20th century, a man named Howard Carter spent years searching for the tomb. He knew the king's name, Tutankhamun. And he thought he knew where the king was buried. Finally, in 1922, just when he was about to give up, he found it. The discovery made headlines all over the world. Before this, nobody had ever heard of King Tutankhamun. Suddenly, everyone knew his name. People began calling him King Tut for short. Today, King Tut is probably the most famous of all the pharaohs. Yet he was not an important or powerful ruler. He was pharaoh for only about nine years. We know he got married. However, we do not even know whether he had children. Tut died very young when he was 18 or 19 years old. And the reason he died remains a mystery. Some historians think he may have been murdered. It is strange to think that he became famous because of what was buried with him. But all the beautiful things in his tomb are important. They tell us about what life was like in ancient Egypt. And together they form a picture of who King Tut was. Chapter 1 Gifts of the Nile. When Tut was born, around 1343 BC, Egypt was already a very old country. Almost 2,000 years old, in fact. The Egyptian Empire lay on the coast of northern Africa, facing the Mediterranean Sea. It was a land of desert and bare hills, where the sun beat down all year long. There were few trees, and rain hardly ever came. But the Nile River, which runs north and south, split the country in two. The Nile is the longest river in the world a little more than 4,000 miles long. It was the heart of ancient Egypt. All along the riverbanks was rich farmland. Peasant farmers tilled their fields with plows pulled by oxen. They sprinkled seeds in the soil to grow wheat and vegetables. They raised pigs and goats and sheep. They planted fruit trees and grew grapes. The river also gave the people fish to eat and ducks to hunt. Because of yearly flooding, there were many weeks when farmers could not work. So the river also provided vacation time for everyone. The Nile was the road that boats traveled, bringing goods from city to city. Clay from Nile mud was used to build houses. All the great cities like Thebes and Memphis grew up near the river. Ancient Memphis may have been the first city in the world to have a million people. From rock quarries, heavy blocks of stone were brought on barges. They were used to build great temples and statues, some of which are still standing today. The river was the lifeblood of the people. Without it there would have been no ancient Egypt. Just desert. But the desert was important, too. It protected Egypt. It was difficult for enemies to attack. They had to cross so many miles of sand in the blazing heat. At one time the empire stretched from present-day Egypt. South to what is now Ethiopia, east into the Sinai Peninsula, and north to what is now Lebanon and Turkey. From these other lands came ivory, furs, gold, cedar wood and other riches.
But even as the empire grew and grew, the Egyptian way of life stayed pretty much the same. The Egyptians did not take up the customs or arts of other people. Over thou sands of years, what they believed in did not change a lot, either. For instance, their ruler was the pharaoh. The word originally meant the great house where the king lived. As time went on, it came to mean the king himself. But the pharaoh was far more than a king. The pharaoh was also the highest priest and judge. He was considered a son of the gods. After his death, he became a god, too. His people worshipped him. No one knows the exact day in 1343 BC when Tut was born. Who were his parents? Even that is not known for sure. His father was most probably Pharaoh Amenhotep IV. The Pharaoh had many wives. Tut's mother may have been one of Amenhotep's less important wives. By the time Tut was ten, he was already married. His wife was one of the Pharaoh's daughters. Her name was Ankesenamen. By this time, Tut's father had died. Tut became king. He wore the tall crowns of the pharaoh. Like all pharaohs, he wore a false beard strapped to his chin. He carried a crook and a flail, it looked like a whip. They were symbols of his power. But did he have real power? No. He was still a child. Chapter 2 An Unusual Father Of all the pharaohs who ruled Egypt, Tut's father had to be among the strangest. First of all, there was the way he looked. Amenhotep's head was oddly shaped. It was very long and narrow. And his hips were very large for a man. Was a rare disease the cause? Some historians think so. In spite of his looks, Amenhotep married a very beautiful queen. Two museums, one in Cairo and one in Berlin, own a bust of her. A bust is a sculpture of someone's head and shoulders. Her name was Nefertiti. Although not of royal birth, Nefertiti looked every inch a queen. Nefertiti became the pharaoh's head wife. Women in ancient Egypt did not have the same rights as men. For example, they did not attend school. But Nefertiti was a powerful woman. She was an important advisor to her husband. She backed him up when he decided to make changes. Big changes. A woman pharaoh. Although women in ancient Egypt were not the equals of men in 1504 BC, a woman became pharaoh. Her name was Hatshepsut. She took power after the pharaoh died suddenly, leaving behind only one very young son, Thutmose III. Most of what we know about Hatshepsut comes from depictions of her in art. At first, she is seen in the typical dress of a woman. But later she is shown in the crown of the pharaoh. She also wears the false beard of the pharaoh. Hatshepsut began many great building projects. But after her death around 1450 BC, Thutmose III became pharaoh. He did his best to erase any records of her. What kinds of changes did Amenhotep make? For one thing, he decided to change the religion. For hundreds and hundreds of years, the people of Egypt had prayed to many gods and goddesses. Some looked like people. Some looked like animals. Some had an animal head and a human body. There was Thoth. He was the god of the moon. Anubis was the god of the cemeteries. Isis was a goddess who protected children. In all, there were about a thousand different gods. Some were only local gods. But the impertant gods had great temples devoted to them. People could visit the temples and pray for the gods' help. Common people, however, were not allowed inside. The most important god of all was Ammoniasare, god of the sun. He appeared in human form. Every day he rode his chariot across the sky. Gods and goddesses. Osiris, Isis, Seth, and Horus were also very powerful gods and goddesses. These four are in the myth of how the earth and the underworld began. 
According to the myth, Osiris and Isis were king and queen of the earth. They had a son named Horus. But Osiris's brother was jealous and wanted to rule earth, his name was Seth, so he killed Osiris and sent him to the underworld. However, Osiris's son, Horus, took back the kingdom from Seth, now Horus became king of the earth. His father, Osiris, became king of the underworld. Seth was shown with the head of an imaginary animal that looks kind of like a greyhound. He was god of the desert. Osiris, god of the dead, was always pictured wrapped tight like a mummy. Isis was thought to protect children and people in need. Horus had the head of a hawk and was god of the sky. The Egyptians believed every pharaoh was the son of Horus. Amenhotep, however, decided to do away with all the gods and goddesses. From then on there was going to be only one god. This god was also god of the sun. But it did not appear in human form like Ammonius R.A. Instead, it looked like the disk of the sun. Sun rays spread out from it. And at the end of each ray was a hand. The hands were a sign that the god was watching over the people of Egypt. The god's name was Aten R.A. The pharaoh believed he was Aten R.A.'s messenger on earth. The only way people could reach the god was through him. Amenhotep got rid of all the priests who served other gods. Money from their temples now went to Aten R.A. Amenhotep changed his name to Akhenaten. His new name meant servant of Aten. Nefertiti changed her name, too, scientists believed to Nefer-Neferuaten. This new name meant Fair is the goddess of Aten. The royal family moved from the city of Thebes. A new capital was built. It was called Amarna. This was where Tut spent his childhood. He grew up learning the new beliefs. The city of Amarna spread for eight miles on either side of the Nile. Here again, Amenhotep did something different. Usually the land west of the river was where the dead were buried. Why? Because the sun sets in the west every evening. Just as sunset brings an end to the day, death brings an end to life. So the dead were buried in the western lands. But Amenhotep decided to do the opposite in the new city. A cemetery was built east of the river. The west side of Amarna was where people lived. New homes and palaces were built as well as new temples, all to Aten R.A. Before this, temples had long halls that led to dark inner rooms. This was where the priests would pray. The new temples to Aten R.A. were open-air buildings that let in the divine light of the sun. The pharaoh also wanted to change the style of paintings. The old style had many rules for artists to follow. A person was always shown from the side. A head was always shown in profile, with one eye looking straight at the viewer. A person's face always looked young and perfect. No wrinkles or gray hair. Both shoulders always faced front, but the torso had to be shown in profile. One leg was always placed directly in front of the other. The paintings were often very beautiful, but the people in them never looked natural or three-dimensional. Why were there so many rules for artists? The ancient Egyptians believed that a painting of a dead person could come to life. So it needed to include all the different parts of the body. An arm or a leg couldn't be left out. And the person would want to look the way he or she did when young and healthy, not when old or sick. But Amenhotep decided to change the rules. He wanted to be portrayed as he really looked, with his long head and narrow eyes. He also wanted paintings of people to seem more natural. Not so formal. One painting shows Amenhotep and his wife playing fondly with three of their six little daughters. Never before had anything like this been shown. The changes, however, did not last. They were stopped soon after Amenhotep's death. He was the pharaoh for about 16 years. The new city of Amarna was soon deserted. The old customs were brought back. It must have been a very confusing time for the whole country. Just when people were getting used to all the changes, they were told to forget them. 
Even if Tut had already been a grown man, it would have been a difficult time to become pharaoh. Chapter 3, The Boy King Still, growing up in ancient Egypt was full of pleasures. Especially if somebody belonged to the royal family. Tut was born a prince. He spent his childhood in a brand new palace in Amarna. Egyptian palaces were huge. All over the palace grounds were beautiful gardens and giant pools the size of lakes. Palace buildings were made of brick and covered in white plaster. The walls were COV aired with colorful paintings. There were separate buildings for the pharaoh's wives. Servants would have seen to all of Tut's needs. Each day they brought his food. Peasants ate bread and drank beer. But for a royal prince, there were meat and vegetables. Figs and dates. Wine was made from grapes grown in the north of Egypt, or from dates or figs or pomegranates. It appears that young Tut was a member of the Clean Plate Club. A small statue of him reveals a chubby child with a plump belly and arms. His servants also bathed and dressed him. They shaved his head, leaving only a braid of hair at the side. This was the hairstyle for a prince. While he slept, they fanned him with ostrich plume fans. That way, the heat would not disturb him. Crocodiles lived in the Nile River. So guards kept watch every time Tut went swimming. Once he got older, he could ride his own chariot drawn by two fine horses with plumed headdresses. Or he could sit back and enjoy a boat trip on the Nile. Tut took his bow and arrow and went hunting with his hounds. In the desert, he might shoot an ostrich. Near the river there were ducks to hunt. Evidently Tut liked playing a popular board game called Senate. He made sure four sets were put in his tomb. Did he like to play music? Perhaps so. Trumpets were found in his tomb. If he didn't want to play himself, musicians would play for him. They would play the harp and lute and pipe. Because of the heat, even princes and princesses wore light, simple clothing. Paintings of Tutankhamun show him in a pleated kilt of white linen. His clothes were simple, but his jewelry was not. He wore heavy gold bracelets and rings. Some necklaces of beads and gold were so large that they covered his chest. His wife wore lots of heavy, beautiful jewelry. So did other royal children. Young boys wore heavy earrings. Two pairs of tuts were placed in his tomb. Ancient Egypt was the first place to develop a written language. Boys learned to read and write starting at four years old. Did Tut know how? Probably. Writing materials were put inside his tomb. A beautiful brush case belonging to Tut was made from wood covered in gold foil with gemstones. If Tut didn't feel like doing his own writing, he could have had a scribe do it for him. A scribe's job was to write down all the pharaoh's orders and letters for him. The Egyptians didn't have pens or pencils. Instead, they took a reed and chewed on the end of it. When the tip split apart, it could be used as a brush. Black ink was made from soot or charcoal. It came in a small, round block. A student had to dip the brush in a water pot before rubbing it on the ink. Egyptians made a kind of heavy paper from papyrus plants along the banks of the Nile. Our word paper comes from papyrus. The stem of the plant was cut into long strips. The strips then were placed in two layers, crossways, and pounded with a hammer. When all the juice was pounded out, the two layers formed a single sheet. That was put under a heavy stone until it dried out even more and became flatter. The last step was to rub the papyrus sheet back and forth with a stone until it was smooth. Instead of binding sheets of papyrus into books, the sheets were rolled up into scrolls. Papyrus paper was very strong. Some scrolls have been found that are thousands of years old. They are still in good shape. Papyrus was also easy to erase. A dab of water was all that was needed to get rid of a mistake. As a child, Tut probably made lots of mistakes learning to write. 
Our alphabet has only 26 letters. His had about 1,000 different symbols called hieroglyphs. Many hieroglyphs look more like pictures than letters. After the ancient empire of Egypt came to an end, the meaning of hieroglyphs was lost for many centuries. No one could translate the writing. It was like a secret code that could not be broken. Then, in 1822, a Frenchman named Jean-Francois Champollion finally figured out how to decipher, translate, hieroglyphs. Many of the objects in King Tut's tomb are inscribed with the pharaoh's name in hieroglyphs. It looked like this. The Rosetta Stone. If IT weren't for a lucky accident, the meaning of hieroglyphs might still be a mystery. In 1799 French soldiers found a large piece of black stone, called basalt. The stone had carvings in three different scripts, hieroglyphs, Greek, and a third kind called demotic. The words on the stone were written in 196 BC to praise a pharaoh named Ptolemy V. All three languages were commonly used at the time so that whoever saw the stone could read it. By the 1800s, no one knew how to read hieroglyphs. But if someone could match up the Greek and the demotic to the hieroglyphs, they could create a key to hieroglyphs. Jean-Francois Champollion finally figured out the basic rules of hieroglyphs after studying the stone for 14 years. Finally, after almost 1,500 years of silence, the language of ancient Egypt could at last be heard. The stone is called the Rosetta Stone after the town where it was found. Today it is in the British Museum in London. Chapter 4, An Early Death During Amenhotep's 16-year-long rule, the empire did not run smoothly. The lands under Egypt's control had to pay tribute. This meant that every year they had to send riches to the pharaoh. For instance, from Nubia in the south came gold. Lebanon had to send rare cedar wood. But the Egyptian army had grown weaker. Tribute had stopped coming in. Then Amenhotep IV was gone. And King Tut was just a child. How could he be expected to make the empire strong again? The real power now lay with Tut's vizier, or chief minister, and one of the army generals. Tut was the ruler in name only. He appeared at important ceremonies and holidays. If Tut had lived beyond his teen years, perhaps he would have grown up to become a strong and wise ruler. Or maybe he always would have been under the thumb of his advisors. Perhaps they were afraid that if Tut had more power, he might try to bring back the strange ways of Amenhotep IV. Instead, the temples of the older gods were reopened. And Thebes, not Amarna, became the royal city once again. Tut moved back there with his queen. They may have had children. In Tut's tomb, along with his coffin, two tiny coffins were also found. They contained the bodies of two baby girls. It is possible that they were Tut's children. What we do know is this, he didn't leave a son behind to become pharaoh after his death. And even in a time when most people did not live to age 40, Tut still died very young. He was only 18 or 19. It is not surprising that some historians have suspected foul play. Perhaps the vizier or the general decided to get rid of Tut. Each of them became pharaoh after Tut by marrying into the royal family. In modern times a popular notion was that Tut died from a blow to the head. But in 2005, CAT scans were done on the pharaoh's 3,000-year-old body. Over two months, cross-sectional images were taken of Tut, from head to toe. Think of Tut's body as a loaf of bread, with each image as a slice of bread. When all the images were assembled, they created a three-dimensional picture of his body, inside and out. So what did scientists learn? There appeared to be an injury to his head, but it did not happen when he was alive. Tut's skull may have been injured when his mummy was found in 1922, so he was not killed by a blow to the head. However, the tests were not able to rule out all other methods of murder. For example, there was no way to tell if Tut had been poisoned. Evidence of poison wouldn't have shown up on the scans. The scientists did find out that Tut had a broken leg. 
It is possible that this injury may have caused an infection that led to his death. The tests on Tut are over now. His body probably does not need to be examined anymore. The man who headed the testing said, we should leave him in peace. T-O-O-T-A-G Tut was placed in his coffin and returned to his burial chamber. Chapter 5, The Afterlife Of course, Tut had no way of knowing that he would die young. Nevertheless, he'd already started planning his tomb before his death. Why? The ancient Egyptians believed in an afterlife. Life after death was very much like life on earth. In fact, it was even better. The journey to the land of the dead was a difficult one. Not everyone was allowed to live there. A special book had magic spells that helped a person reach the land of the dead. The book was called the Book of the Dead. The Book of the Dead. After a person died, his or her spirit wanted to reach the land of the dead. A book of powerful spells and songs was thought to help the spirit on the journey. The book is commonly referred to as the Book of the Dead. Over time, the book grew longer until it contained nearly 200 spells. It could be purchased by anyone who could afford it. It was often illustrated in color, and a copy of it was placed inside a coffin, in a tomb, or spells from it were written on tomb walls. The most important chapter described the ritual of the weighing of the heart. Every person, even the pharaoh, had to pass a test. In the underworld, his or her heart was put on one side of a scale. On the other was a feather. If the person had led a good life, the heart would be lighter than the feather. And that meant the person could enter the land of the dead. In the land of the dead, the person's spirit would continue to enjoy all the same pleasures as before. Eating. Drinking. Hunting. Playing games. Going for boat rides. A tomb was not just a resting place for the body. It was like another home, filled with absolutely everything the person would need or want in the afterlife. Of course, poor peasants did not own many things. Nor could they afford large tombs. Often, poor people were just buried in the sand. But a royal tomb had many rooms, all of which were filled with treasures. The tomb of Tutankhamun was very small for a pharaoh. It had only four rooms. That's because it was meant for someone else. Probably a member of the court. But when Tut died, his own much grander tomb was not ready. There was no choice except to bury him someplace else. The largest tombs of pharaohs are the three pyramids at Giza. The huge statue of the Sphinx is there. 2. Watching over the pyramids. The pyramids were built long before Tut's time more than 1,000 years before. The biggest pyramid belonged to a pharaoh named Cheops. It took approximately 100,000 workers 20 years to complete. The body of Cheops was placed deep inside, in a secret chamber. In ancient times, people knew that treasure lay buried with the body of the pharaoh. Unfortunately, the pyramids were looted. Robbers made off with the objects meant for the pharaoh's afterlife. Pharaohs who lived later decided to build secret tombs to keep robbers away. The tombs were underground hiding places. They had all sorts of traps. Some tombs had stone blocks placed above the entrance. If the door was opened, the stone would fall and kill the robber. Inside, there were false MS to confuse robbers. And if certain floor tiles were stepped on, they gave way, sending robbers down a shaft to their death. But all the planning and all the traps did not stop thieves. Somehow they managed to find the tombs. They broke into them and made off with the riches. Before Howard Carter found Tut's tomb in 1922, people thought every